Hello everybody, it is time for another live stream. Lamont, you, Lamont, you are the first person in here today. I don't know people like to say, first, <laughs> you did it. So today's live stream, we're going to talk about significant others, because I thought that's a good topic we've never covered. I love to come up with new topics, and we're running out of new topics, and sometimes we have to recycle older topics. That's okay. But, uh, you know, uh, this one seemed appropriate. It involved me this week, and, you know, so I have story time for you again. Uh, but... Uh, at the same time, I'm sure some of you have some great experiences as well and some advice that you could offer that we could all benefit from. So I want to remind you right at the onset here that if you are a member of Club Meals Reef, we would love to hear your thoughts on this topic. So if you can go in there today and share what you've done to make your reef experience with your significant other go smoothly, we'd love to hear your tips and tricks. <laughs> I'm going to discuss some of the things I have in my head. You know, we all look at things differently. And uh, if you're not a member yet, please join. I, I do approve each person individually, so sometimes it takes a little while to get to it. The uh, current, I don't know how many members we have, probably 8,500, 8, I don't know, somewhere in there. And uh, it's a really good group because we are nice to each other. And, uh, you know, just like this channel, we're, we're nice to each other here. We have nice conversations. No one's being put down or insulted. When you ask a question, I answer it, even if it's been asked before. It's the exact same thing in the group. And so people feel um, safer to ask their questions and not be attacked or may, be made belittled or be made fun of. So I uh, want to encourage you to be in that group because that's all week long, every single day. You can just hang out, and, uh, and if you have something you want to show me, you can tag me. You can tag Milos Refink or you can tag Mark Levinson. And uh, if you don't tag me, maybe a moderator will tag me or some other member. And that way I will see your thread. So please join when you have a chance. And if you haven't done it yet, this is your invite yet again. Uh, all right, so story time. Uh, two nights ago, I was talking with Caitlin, and she said, I really want these goby fish, you know, these little tiny gobies. And she found on Live Aquarium and Diver's Den a mated pair with a shrimp. So it was really a threesome. <laughs> and she said, I want these. And I was like, well, yeah. And she says, I want a fish tank. And I was like, okay. And so I was like, where are we going to put it? And the point is, is if your significant other shows any interest at all in this hobby, <clears throat> pounce. <laughs> That's my best advice. Give them what they want. I mean, come on, seriously. Uh, you know, when you're doing anything in your uh, dating or married life, you want to make sure that you are providing good communication and plan things out and discuss things openly to avoid resentment and anger and, uh, and squabbling. <laughs> so I would really encourage, you know, if you're saying, well, where are we going to put it? That's the first question, because then we, we as a couple can decide, I really like this spot. Is that a good spot for all of us? Will that work? Do you prefer this other room? You know, that kind of thing. And this may be you that I'm talking to and your significant other has zero interest in this at all. But if you include them in the thought process, there is a kind of an attachment involved there, which can help overcome some of the initial hurdles about what this hobby does to us. Because let's be frank, we get obsessed. We, we want to go bigger. We want to get more. We spend money left and right. And the uh, other person may be saying, whoa, <laughs> I had no idea how bad this is, how addictive this is. So it's not like setting up a goldfish bowl. It's not like setting up a beta. You know, we, we set up a reef tank. We set up all this gear. We have to learn electrical. We have to learn photography. We have to learn everything. And so anyway, we were talking about possibly getting a 60-gallon tank. That would be her fish-only tank. And uh, as we were talking, you know, and I knew it would be a little wild to get a tank and put it in the corner and make sure there's enough electricity to support yet one more aquarium in this house uh, in addition to all the things I do here. And uh, then I thought, well, you know, the anemone cube might work. And her eyes got really excited and huge. She's like, this sounds amazing. And I said, you know, but there's a lot of aptasia <laughs> that needs to come out of there. So yesterday, she spent half the day cleaning the anemone cube. So I want to show you guys what it looks like. Look how pretty it is. She did a great job. And uh, I got some stuff I got to tell you. It's crazy. So, but... Um, Initially, what happened here is she, that front corner right down here, she went ahead and scraped off all the Montipora 
that was Dory's ancient home. She used to sleep in that Montipora colony. And then as she got bigger, she stopped using it. And then pieces broke off. And I had to, you know, clean up a little bit. But there was this big, ugly patch here on the front of the glass. But there was a bunch of anemones on it. So it's kind of pretty. And I said, you know what? Why don't you just scrape that all away? And if you want, you could go ahead and catch Dory. That'd be great. <laughs> so she said, all right, that sounds fantastic. And she said, where are the nets? And I so I pointed her to a couple of nets and she was in there and of course Dory knowing I knew how Dory would react like nope and she was super skittish and was hiding in the back and so I suggested putting some nori on a clip and we'll put and then maybe she could get lucky and move really fast and scoop it out as Dory was snacking which of course didn't work but it did bring Dory out into the open and so she continually kept going back to the tank but as soon as she walked up the tank Dory took off into the rock work so you know I teased her uh, I took a picture I put on Instagram, and uh, then she was determined at one point. She was, you know what, this fish is coming out. I'm doing it. <laughs> so she uh, she was on the step ladder. She had a couple of nets, and or maybe maybe she just had the one. She had the bigger net of the two, and I suggested, why don't you shoo it toward me, and maybe I can help, or maybe I can you know come from another angle. And what ended up happening was. She would reach into the tank and put her fingers into the rock work to make Dory come out into the open. And she was swimming around the front and darting around and swam directly into my net and I caught Dory. It was that easy. I had no trouble at all catching that fish. <laughs> it was great. So Dory has been moved into the frag tank like I've been saying now for a long time. Everyone kept saying, but you're going to put her in the 400 gallon, right? No, I'm not. So I uh, put her in the frag tank and uh, she is not happy, but you know she'll get used to it. There's a lot less tentacles to dodge in there, so that's a good thing. And I fed last night, and I didn't really see her come out, so she's probably hiding in the back. She's a little miffed. Uh, I did discover some interesting things during the process of moving from one tank to another. Of course, I checked the temperature, and the frag tank was cooler to the touch, to the hand. And I was like, huh, let me uh, grab a glass thermometer. So I stuck it inside the uh, anemone cube, and I think it measured somewhere around 81, which is, I mean, it's a glass thermometer. It doesn't mean it's accurate. It's just a tool for measuring. And my apex said the tank was, I think, 78.5. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd, but all right, whatever. Let's just pretend it's 81. Then I put the same glass thermometer in the other tank, and I measured, and it was measuring 78. So I said, well, there's a three-degree difference. So I grabbed Dory, and we put her in a small bucket, and put her by the frag tank and I added a cup of water every six minutes until the water was doubled which at that point she was acclimated to the right temperature and I could put her into the frag tank and that was done and people I say well did you film it I'm like no <laughs> and let me tell you why uh, when we are doing anything that seems a little little bit traumatic people um, may use it against us so uh, I didn't feel like it was smart to show us trying to chase a fish in an aquarium because people out there with ulterior motives might say, look how aggressive they are, look how mean they are, that poor fish, etc., etc." We just don't need that kind of drama in this hobby. We have enough going on and we don't want to hurt our reputation. I mean, obviously, anytime someone's trying to catch a fish in any type of aquarium, whether it's freshwater, brackish, or salt, there's gonna be some activity and the livestock typically does not want to be caught. That's normal, right? So having this video of arms and elbows and butts trying to catch a fish didn't seem, point, uh, seem pointless to me, or if anything, detrimental. But she was not harmed. She was not given a heart attack. You know, Caitlin just made sure she could not get into the rock work and hide. <laughs> so that worked out fine. And uh, show you the tank again. So it looks really nice and clean. Uh, she worked on the sand bed a good long time. She, I gave her this kind of a plastic strainer, well, plastic handle with a strainer. Almost like you could, I don't know, put tea leaves in it and pour water through it. It was that kind of a thing. And she sifted some of the sand and would scoop out aptasia that was just popping out like flowers out of the sand bed. And it makes sense there's aptasia in this tank because it is the anemone cube and aptasia are glass anemones. But there was too many. They were ugly. And so now they are mostly gone. And the two of us will continue to remove any that we see just to keep making the tank look nicer and nicer. The rock work got moved a little bit. There's a coral back here that used to be in the front right corner. It used to be way over here. It was an Acan Echinata. And so while we were doing things, I told her, I said, why don't we cut off the dead skeleton that is on the, uh, the edge of the coral, where the coral no longer lives? 
And she said, okay, how? And I said, I've got this saw. <laughs> so I went ahead and I, uh, I, I set up the saw and I showed her a, a very easy way to trim off some of the skeleton. And then I said, would you like to try it? And she's like, yes! And she was super excited. So here is the skeleton that she cut off with her own two hands. You can see the polyps or the skeletal where the polyps would have been for the Acan Echinata. There's also a bunch of dead uh, baby starfish in there, or brittle starfish. But what I like is the texture inside. It's so cool looking. The porosity is amazing, right? And uh, so this slice she cut off and did a great job. And now the coral looks sort of like, like a pizza pie. And it is in the corner of the tank, and it's a nice view. Matter of fact, I'll change the angle of this camera, I think. Let's see if I can move this thing. So now you can see the tank from another angle, and you can see the uh, Aiken Echinata down here, which is a good spot right down here, because if it's going to try to sting anything, it's going to like push an enemy's back. That's about it. But it doesn't have anything it can be aggressive to. And now, if we get a Gobi Shrimp pair, they can be anywhere in the sand bed, and they can do their little burrowing thing and live together and be happy. Now, the only downside of the... Uh, the uh, shrimp goby pair was that they sold out. <laughs> we, we saw them, we thought they were awesome. Uh, I just didn't pull out the credit card on the spot because at the time we were discussing getting a tank and you don't buy livestock before you have an aquarium. But she found something she liked. And I wanted, as you know, I said, it, when you're a couple, you try to do things together, right? And so I wanted to discuss with her the possibilities. And then I even talked about an alternative that could work now. And that got her very excited. So she spent a lot of time on this tank cleaning it, and she keeps walking past it and she says, the tank is so pretty. And I'll tell you this, now that she's done that, um, I said, well, you're going to help me with the 400 too, right? <laughs> and she's like, sure. So we're going to do pretty much the same thing. It's what I've been wanting to do for a while, and that's to siphon the sand bed around the perimeter of the 400 gallon. And then we can go ahead and move corals out of the way and work in teamwork until the tank is nice and pristine because on November 10th, it's the seven year anniversary of both of these tanks. So it'll be a great time to have a nice pristine tank and having her help is great. And I love the idea. And so that is on the books of things to do together. Now, what if your significant other has no interest whatsoever? How on earth will you convince them to be involved? Uh, I mean, that's going to be an individual case-by-case -case basis. And that's why I was saying, you know, I would love to hear your insights as well. But I can tell you some of the things that I would do, me, is I would take the person to public aquariums. Uh, they are reopened now. You can go to some. And just walk together and look at things and see what that person likes. And you know, see if, they, uh, if he or she likes a certain type of fish or a certain type of coral, uh, a certain type of invertebrate. And then can you incorporate that into your tank to make it our tank instead of just my tank? And if you can do that, that can be a good starting point. And if you can't do that, if you can't incorporate it into yours, do you have room to give them their own tank? And is there anything wrong with them having a little tank? Let's say you have a big tank. Let's say you have a 120 gallon tank or 180 gallon tank or even bigger. And they said, well, I really like this. And you say, oh, I can't put that in my tank because it'll eat such and such. Then they're, you know, they become dejected. They feel like they've been put down. Or, um, or shut down. And so you could at that point say, well, what if I got you, a, or what if we got a bio cube or you know, some other little rimless tank that you like, then they could have that thing they like and they could learn to work on the little tank. It's not nearly as overwhelming as working on the big tank. Now, does that mean they're suddenly gonna wanna clean your protein skimmer? No, don't, don't expect that. Uh, and matter of fact, I would highly recommend you do all the heavy lifting. So that way the uh, significant other is just enjoying the easy part of the hobby, which is looking and taking pictures and feeding, but you know, just kind of tackle the hard parts initially so it doesn't discourage or run them off. And I feel like if you do that, you will have a lot better chance of success. Uh, at the very least, you will grow the tolerance level to where they can tolerate more. <laughs> and that's a good thing because, you know, one of the things that 
any of us want is to be accepted for what we love. And so we love this hobby and we week after week you guys come to this channel to learn more. I know a lot of you watch this channel with your spouses because you tell me that. <laughs> and it's funny because I've had, like I had one woman run up to me at Macna and she had no interest in the hobby at all, but her husband did. And yet she enjoyed watching and listening and learning from this show, even though she was not invested in the aquarium whatsoever. But she was listening and paying attention and enjoying the live stream, which is kind of cool. So I would just recommend that you keep working. And it's not just a one-time thing. Don't say, okay, I got him or her the tank. You know, it's could be a continuous thing. It could even be something like you do. You know how, <laughs> I'm comparing to other things, but you know how, let's say you're, Boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, I don't know what to, I just I keep saying significant other. Um, your significant other is cooking. So then you go in and you clean the dishes, right? So what if while they were at work or they're resting or whatever, you just clean the glass on their tank so it's nice when they wake up or they come home. Uh, as long as you're not doing anything to hurt their system, that little bit of extra effort could be appreciated. And uh, if they choose to do that for your tank, uh, even better, right? But you would definitely want to have some discussions in advance. Say, hey, if I ever wanted to clean your tank, is there anything that you want me to know? <laughs> is there anything I should know or should not do? Like, for example, last week I showed you guys the Reef Safe soap that you could use to wash your hands to get rid of any kind of oils or perfumes or anything off your skin. And the first thing Caitlin did was she scrubbed up to her, you know, her, her upper arms to make sure because she was going to be reaching in the tank, make sure there was nothing on her skin that could affect the livestock. And then I'm going to switch this back. It's more blue now. It's so dark. I don't know what's going on with this camera, but uh, let me jump into EcoSmart Live and just fix it. I did this before, and it looks a little bit better. Yeah, it doesn't even want to listen to me right now. How weird is that? It works until we get on the live stream, and then it's like, nope. And then we cube. I don't know. All right, well, it's just going to be a little bit darker for now. But um, with all the work that was going on in the aquarium, <clears throat> she kept saying, wow, I'm really getting stung on my arms. And so one of the things I suggested to her was, why don't I go ahead and take a tube sock, like a white tube sock you, you know, I wear, and cut off the toes, and you can wear it like a sleeve to protect your forearms from being stung by the tentacles. And so she tried that initially, but then within a few minutes, she was like, nah, forget it. But uh, she said, man, man, I'm, my arms are really burning in here. And I was just like, well, you know, I mean, you were in there a long time, and you're brushing up against them a lot, so I could see how that could be a thing. And then uh, I, I had to reach in the tank. <clears throat> And that is when I discovered what had happened. And I was like, wow, what a difference. So when I put my arms in the tank, I think I was lifting things out or moving the corals out of the way as she was gravel backing the sand bed. The uh, water was stinging the heck out of my arms like it was a tank full of jellyfish. And that's when I realized that all, well, not all, but many of the anemones had released their nematocysts into the water column. And it was just blowing around the water. You know, you couldn't see it, but it was stinging the heck out of our arms. And so... It just felt like you're putting your arms in, I don't know, poison ivy, I don't know, something. But it was it was amazing how much you felt it. And I didn't touch one single anemone, but it was just from all the manhandling and working the tank and moving the rock a little bit and, you know, chasing a fish. It really kicked up a storm in there. And then I thought, wow, this tank has to drain into the 400 gallon. <laughs> this should be interesting to see how the reef responds. But what we did was we did 15 gallons worth of water change out of the 60 gallon cube. And then I refilled the sump with more salt water from the poly tank and then turned on the return pump. So we did reduce some of the nematocysts that were in the water column before it could get into the main tank. But then, you know, the water did get uh, all intermingled and I looked at the livestock in the main tank and there really wasn't much of a response. The sea bay looked a little bit annoyed for some reason, but uh, the fish all acted normal and... Uh, uh, that was as far as it went. We got lucky. You know, it wasn't like there, it was going to be some epic thing. And the clownfish seemed completely unaffected other than they were completely hiding the whole time. So um, what else do I want to tell you here? Let me see my list. Uh, oh, another thing. So I talked about taking your significant other to a public aquarium. Another thing that you could do, you could entice them, is to go to a fish store or two. <laughs> like visit some fish stores together 
and just walk around and look at things and point out what things are. And you, if you know what it is, you can say what it is. Um, I know this might make you nervous, but let them see the prices so they understand these things are not disposable, they're not dirt cheap, and that you know when you get something, you want it to live because it costs you some money, which then leads into you should create a budget together. And that way, if you're agreeing this money is being spent, it avoids a lot of conflict in your relationship. And so I would definitely encourage, and you know, like I said, some people joke, I don't want my significant other to know anything of how much I spend, because if they knew, they'd kill me. Well, I don't know that hiding that is a great approach, so I'm not going to recommend it. I would just say, you know, I did spend a lot this month, but I'm going to really hold off for the next few months. You know, the things I'll buy will be test kits and, you know, fish food salt. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it under control because I bought that really expensive pump or whatever. I mean, that that's just the conversation I think you should have <laughs> rather than trying to hide it. You know, rather than trying to ship in, you know, $3,000 worth of lighting and put a note on the box, don't put this by the front door because my spouse will see it and kill me. <laughs> I just saw that uh, yesterday on Facebook. That was funny. Uh, you know, we, you know, communicate. There's things they want too, and they're going to spend money on it as well. So budget is smart if you want to stay together long term. <laughs> and if you can discuss things and you have conversations and be reasonable or find ways to make extra money, to afford the things you feel the tank needs, that will help. But uh, so those are some of my tips, some of my recommendations of what you could do that I feel could work in your benefit. And if they're absolutely 100% against it, you may never convince them. You may have to work on it when they're asleep. You may have to work on it when they're at work, you know, and, and just it's just fine when they come home and you're, you're nowhere near the darn thing. Uh, there is, <laughs> I guarantee you, the tank will have a problem and something will go really, really wrong right when you have to be somewhere important. Like, we have to go to a wedding today, you know, and then your tank is like leaking all over the floor. Or, you know, your RODI system is flooding the back room because you forgot to turn it off again and, uh, you know, you get yelled at. So these are things you need to learn how to avoid. And, you know, one of the first things I tell anyone with an RODI system is to have a float valve on their container they collect water in so the floor never gets wet. And if you are not doing a float valve, you must get a float valve. And I sell them on my website. Also, I found a thing at Harbor Freight years ago. I'm sure you can find this on Amazon as well. But uh, they had a, uh, a uh, it looked like a little, what are you doing? Jack's trying to get in the shot. Here's Jack. Hey, Jack. <laughs> How about that? Enjoy. Um, if uh, you go to Harbor Freight or you look on Amazon, you can find some kind of a detector that will make noise if the floor gets wet. And that works out pretty good in a utility room where there's laundry and there's a sink and there's you know an, an RODI system. And if the water would touch the the uh, the sensor probes, which are two little metal tines that are down on the tile or uh, floor the flooring or whatever it is, it'll wail like a smoke detector and you'll come running to turn off the water. So that would be very smart. And that thing cost me like six or eight bucks. So I, you, know, you just put some batteries in it and boom, you're done. I would highly recommend that because you will keep the peace in the household by not flooding a room and getting everything soaking wet. So please do that. Uh, if you can shop at Milo's Reef, there's all kinds of things there that could benefit your aquarium. Uh, the float valves are on there in the plumbing section. You're gonna have to be good. Be good. All right, I'm gonna put this on the other camera for a second and hopefully keep the peace with this dog. Come here. Let's see. Um, oh, something new that came to the shop is a uh, water test stirrer. And it's uh, one of my suppliers, Coral View, sells it. It's called the Smart Stir. It comes from Auto Aqua. And they are just came into stock. I have 10 of them right now. If you're interested, they're $30 each. I'll put them on the website. And it is a magnetic stirrer where you put in you know, a little bit of water in the vial and you hit the on button. And it's spinning as you add the drops. So you don't have to shake your vials. And I've been using a magnetic stirrer for years. And I saw this thing at Macna a year and a half ago, and it finally is available. And the nice thing about this little stirrer, you don't need a battery. It's USB charged with its own lithium ion battery built in. And so you just charge it up and it's good to go for, I don't know how long, but you know, when you're doing one, two, three, five, six, seven tests in a row, having that magnetic stirrer will make your life so much easier. So I highly recommend it to you. And I would, uh, 
I'll show you what it looks like. And then, like I said, I will put it on the website today because I don't want to sit on 10 of them. I want you to use them and enjoy them and say how fantastic they are in your life. So let me find the picture. Shh. Let's see. All right, so here's a picture of it. And it's just a magnetic stirrer. And you can see the big power button. There's no way to control the speed that I am aware of. I haven't even opened the box yet. Shh, hush. But uh, I think you'll enjoy that a lot. So I want to let you guys know about that so you can have one as well. Uh, all right, I'm going to pause for my topic. Today, by the way, my neck is killing me like usual. So I... Uh, There may be some barking today. Sorry about that. Um, so let me answer some of your questions. And I feel like there's more that we have to discuss, but this is a good start. <laughs> Joe Palmer says, I was wondering when we were gonna start talking about dating advice. Let's see. Brian's Aquarium says, time to do my weekly water tests. If you ever stop live streaming, I think my tank will die. Uh, Mike Flores says, I just started the BRS 2 point balling method. What is your experience or thought? Hush. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to put her up in the room. Be right back. Let me show you the tank again. Alrighty, maybe, maybe she will behave. Hush. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Let's see. Um, oh, so the answer to the BRS question, I'll put it back here on the screen again, was, you know, do you have any thoughts on dosing two part? Well, yeah, I do. Uh, it, the balling method is a term that comes from Germany and to be totally honest, I read about it like twice and forgot everything I learned. So I can't discuss balling. Um, I don't know that it's different from what we do here in the U.S. I don't know why they call it what they call it. It's like I said, I just can't remember. And I remember grabbing the boxes from Fauna Marin and reading them <laughs> and trying to grasp it so it would be in my head in case these questions came up. But two-part dosing should be done every single day on your tank. And originally, if everything was ionically balanced in your aquarium, you could just add equal parts of alkaline and calcium to your tank every single day and maintain perfect numbers. But we have noticed over the years, uh, through more and more people doing this, our tanks are not ionically balanced and there's always something a little bit off. And we may need to dose a, a lot of alkalinity every day, but only a little bit of calcium to maintain the perfect numbers. As you are trying to dial those in, you will be using what your tank needs. Also, I always recommend you dose alkalinity first thing in the morning, and I recommend you dose calcium in the afternoon or evening. Uh, I kind of like it to be 12 hours apart. Some people prefer to dose throughout the day. Others like to dose only during the daytime hours. I mean, there's a lot of approaches, but the reason you dose the alkalinity in the morning is because it buffers up the pH. 
because your pH is at the lowest point in the mornings, especially in the early morning, 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., your pH is very low in the tank. And if you dose alkalinity somewhere around that time zone, you will bring up the pH so that it's not so low in the tank, which is important. And then, you know, you can add the calcium much later in the day. It doesn't matter when you add that. And if you want to dose one dose, uh, of the right amount each day, that's fine. If you want to dose that amount over 12 separate little doses, you can do that too. Uh, I don't. <laughs> but if you want to, you could. And there are some people that are like, I dose 24 times a day, you know, basically once every hour. And we've learned because of the alkalinity monitor that Jim Welsh came up with about hmm, five years ago. Uh, he came up with this thing and he discovered through measuring constantly that alkalinity is being taken up during the daylight hours or when the lighting is on, when the tank is bright. But during the night, almost no alkalinity is being absorbed at all. So he said it only makes sense to dose it during the daytime so that your corals can use it. And I thought that's pretty, you know, that was a pretty interesting discovery. And a lot of us have made adjustments in how we dose now. Now I run a calcium reactor rather than two-part dosing. And the calcium reactor runs 24 hours a day and it doesn't slow down at night. It doesn't speed up in the daytime. It just keeps dosing. And I've been doing the same darn thing for 16 years. So uh, it, it just works and I'm happy with it. But when I have done two-part dosing in the past, I did I poured it in by hand and I put alkaline in the morning. <clears throat> I did calcium in the afternoon. And uh, magnesium I did as needed, which is really the third part of two-part dosing. So it's really three-part dosing. <clears throat> uh, Alice says, it's a fish only. As your corals start you know, growing, you could move, move them into her tank. I'm sure she will get some corals in that tank. She's learning about corals now. She's enjoying that, but she knows a lot about fish. So that is already something in my favor. Uh, Macy's daddy says, I'm lucky my wife is into the tanks as much as I am. My problem is she picks coral like she picks jewelry. Dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. <laughs> Only the best. And I believe him. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Joe says he got his wife into the hobby. Congratulations. That's great. And Kevin says his wife has a freshwater tank that she loves. See, I would have a huge problem with that. <laughs> Only because it's my ongoing joke that I don't like freshwater. Um, Louis asks the question, can four Ecotech XR15 Gen 4 Pros be enough lighting for Waterbox 220? Or do you recommend I get a fifth one? I would need to know the length and the width of your aquarium, preferably in inches, to answer that question. Uh, Alex says, what do you think about the Moorish idolfish? Oh, they're very pretty. They're kind of hard to keep alive. Uh, we have better foods these, year, these days, <laughs> these years, these days, and so you may not have as much of a challenge. It used to be very hard to get one and keep it alive in the past. And now that we have uh, resources of much better foods, especially in the frozen food area, you can definitely get the right stuff to help that fish live. It's a, it is kind of a expert level fish, as far as I recall. So I would just suggest maybe the Heniocus instead, which is a much easier version of what looks like the Morris Idol. They're very similar in look. Ethan asks, are these all saltwater tanks? Yes, they are. Mr. Reefbuster says, I always tell my wife Black Friday pricing for things I buy for my tanks. Let's see. Uh, uh, Ailia says, my wife entered the hobby and now she has her own nano tank for anemones. Nice. That's awesome. <laughs> Ted says, I'm in a weird position. Okay, so here's when the squabbling's really gonna start. I wanna build a new tank in our new home, but I'm afraid she'll hate coralline algae growth, which I appreciate. Can you imagine if your biggest fight is that you want coralline and she does not? Oh my goodness. How are you guys gonna sort that out in court? Let's see. Okay, uh, Michael says, how do you use a filter sock from time to time with your sump design? I know you normally have water returning to the sump in a bubble tower where the sock would normally be. Uh, it depends on the sump. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I, uh, the, the sump I have now removed the bubble tower. And what I did instead this time is I made a modular system to where I could have nothing, I could run the Clarisy, or I could put in my sock box, which is this acrylic box that fits, uh, <laughs> how do I want to say that, directly into the corner of the skimmer zone where the drains pour in through an opening of the sock box, and then I have a seven inch sock in there. And I can have it in there for two, three days, and it has a lid on top, so it's absolutely silent. I can divert all the drains to dump only into the sock if I want to go crazy. And I did that. I wanted to see what maximum speed through only those drains, only in the sock box, would look like and sound like, and it worked fantastically. So like when we're cleaning the sand bed, that would be the perfect time to install the sock box temporarily and do some heavy cleaning and use some really fine socks like the five micron and really catch the sediment and then we'll vacuum out. We'll do a massive water change and uh, and then when I'm done, remove it and put the equipment back to the normal setup. So I came up with that and if you go to the video I did last summer showing the, the new sump install, you'll see the sock box itself. And it's a really neat uh, thing. I like it, It's just been sitting in the corner of the fish room unused for a long time. But I see that happening you know, later this month because I would like to have both tanks very pristine and pretty when it's time to do the seven year anniversary of the two tanks. Now, if you have a bubble tower in a sump and there's no room for a sock, you can always put the sock somewhere else. And you could divert your plumbing to the sock temporarily or you could run a pump that pushes water into the sock as just sort of like a mechanical filtration, like you would suddenly push water into a protein skimmer, or push it into a reactor. And so you're not gonna catch every drain that drains out unless you can somehow remove the plumbing going into your sump and put it into the sock. Now you might get creative with some PVC and do some valves, but the one thing that I have to forewarn you is that if you set up like a T and a couple of valves and you now have water going to the bubble tower all the time, but you have a valve to go to a potential sock area, you know, for occasionally, for occasional reasons, make sure that section of pipe is empty. That it's not, you have the valve closed and there's just water sitting in there that can't move because that will be super toxic. And when you do open the valve, it could just dump that toxicity right into your system and affect your livestock. So make sure you drain that plumbing and then close your valve so now it's a dry spot and it's completely safe for whenever you're ready to run a sock occasionally. But that's how I did it. And then other times when I ran a sock occasionally, I just would, like I said, I would try to remember. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so I used to have five drains on this tank behind me. And then when they replaced the tank with a new one because it leaked, it was four drains. And even when I, I ran my plumbing down into the bubble tower, but I put unions on the pipes so I could turn off the return pump, let them drain. And then I could loosen the union, move the pipe into the sock, and tighten the union again, and then turn the return pump back on, and I was good to go. And that would work fine for, like I said, two or three days while I'm running the socks. And then when I was done, turn off the return pump, loosen the union, put the pipe back in the sock box, tighten the union. So that's the other alternative that's better than valves and, and potential spots of toxic water. I hope that helps you a little bit. I know it's a lot of visuals in your head. You're like, well, he said this. I hope you kind of understand what I mean. Oh, Mermaid's Reef has such a good suggestion when it comes to getting a significant other involved in the hobby. Involve the kids, because how can a parent say no at that point? And that's so true. When your kid says, oh, I really like this, or I really want that, we automatically feel guilty, and we want to reward them with something. And with COVID going on, and we're all staying home more than ever, it's actually a great time to have another aquarium in the house. <laughs> One more piece of entertain entertainment, as well as something to work on, because it's a hobby. Um, and there's a sense of pride. When Caitlin was cleaning up this tank and making it so pristine, I just knew in my head she's going to like that tank even more so because she was involved with it rather than just walking past it to go cook, you know, food. And uh, so, yeah, and I was right. <laughs> so I do uh, recommend being involved. And I love that idea of getting the kids involved. Uh, Pickle Boy says, I have two clownfish. Can I add two more to my 65-gallon tank? No, I would not recommend that. You have two. They're hopefully going to mate and be you know, a bonded pair. If you add any other clowns to your tank, they were going to fight, and you're going to end up with two, and you're going to have two dead ones. So I don't recommend that. Uh, R. Sellers says, any word on getting six-month Trident reagents? No, and I'm kind of on the fence about getting any more to sell. 
uh, it just financially it's not a good selling thing for me on my website uh, because it costs so much to get that heavy item to me and then when I put in a box to ship it to you there's the expense is high for the buyer you know for the customer and it's just there's not enough markup on those to justify it I'm kind of <laughs> I'm being honest I'm just kind of like eh. I don't think I want to carry that. Now, if people are buying reagent with other things, it would at least make the sale more logical. But a lot of people like to buy one thing they need. And I understand that approach. I went to Target yesterday to get one thing, and I walked out with a shopping cart full of goodies. But, uh, <laughs> I, you know, sometimes you're like, well, I just want this. I'm going to get that. And uh, so all I have in stock right now are two-month reagents. I've heard that Neptune is about to release the six-month reagents to some vendors. So I would keep your eyes open and see who's going to carry it. Um, Jason says, I have green hair algae starting to take hold of my rocks. Before and currently, my nitrates have been 3 to 4, and my phosphates are 0.02 to 0.04. I started my first dose of Vibrant last week. Any advice? Well, your water's great. I would say your lights are either running too long, or you don't have nearly enough cleanup crew. But if you want to use Vibrant, you can. I have no experience with it, so I can't give you any advice on it. Um, just be careful. Um, talk to others, maybe in Club Miller's Reef that have used it. Ask them exactly what they used, how they used it, how long they used it. Get some specific answers is my recommendation. And I would love if they also provided before and after pictures so you can see how well it worked for them. So that way you know. That would be my recommendation. Uh, Michael says, I work in a lo local fish store as a second job, so the money I earn from that goes to the tank, which helps a lot in getting, and you get a discount or two. And that's true, because if you're an employee, you might get a discount in the fish store. Uh, Derby City says, can a small frag tank work in a sump instead of a refugium? Yes, it can. You'll probably need some extra power heads down there to create adequate flow for the frags in that area that would have been the refugium. And that shouldn't be a problem. And then you're going to have to have a really good light over that area to light that coral that you're trying to grow. And the light may cause algae to grow in other parts of the sump because you're putting so much light down there for the frags. So that is the downside. Yeah, she says to Jack that her dogs, or his or her dogs, are saying hi back. <laughs> They're saying woof, woof, woof. And yeah, Macy's daddy says dogs make the best doorbells. Isn't that the truth? Oh, that's awesome. Adam says, my wife only started appreciating the tank after we had a baby who loved staring at the tank. My budget has since increased a bit. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Lazy Lagoon Reefer says, My girlfriend loves my tanks, although I do all the heavy lifting and the maintenance. Anytime I get something new, she's always next to the tank admiring it and loves going to the LFS with me. That's awesome. That's perfect. How great is that? Um, Curtis, you said you had some questions for me last night on Instagram, so tell me what your questions are. Um... Right now, huge issues with glass clarity. Uh, I guess I need to know more information to answer you on that, but clean your glass. <laughs> uh, it could be the tank is old and the glass has gotten fogged up. It might be something you have to replace the, the aquarium itself. Oh, I like this. Mermaid's Reef says, could you train a dog to bark if the RODI overflows? Oh, that's awesome. Mark Waller says, hello everyone, I just wanted to say hi. I'm sitting in my kayak in Monterey, California Ocean, hanging out with some sea otters, enjoying the stream. How nice is that? I love it. Uh, Yashiv asked the question about, you know, dosing two-part, what about trace elements? You literally can dose trace elements in addition to several brands that uh, have it. Brightwell sells it, uh, Kent has it, uh, Continuum has it, I mean, probably every brand has trace elements you can purchase. And also, every time you do a water change, the salt mix has a lot of trace elements. So if you're staying on top of your water changes, you will be putting in trace elements anyway, but your alkaline, your calcium, your dosing is specific for coral growth, which the salt mix alone can't provide in a reef that's really growing. So that's why we have the additional uh, 
additive every single day to maintain those numbers to keep them at the same height all week long or all month long before you do your next water change. When you do the water change, your trace elements are added. This tank in the background is bothering me. It just looks too bright and on fire, and I hate that. So I'm going to turn off one light on there. That'll help a little bit. Actually, I could just turn off two and make myself feel a lot better. Yeah, that looks better. <laughs> I know, it's very blue. Oh, nice. Elia says, I do everything you said, Mark, and I can assure you it works. I even sometimes send her to buy me a coral, and she ends up buying two. <laughs> That's nice. It's fun to discuss corals, too, and uh, seeing what they like, and see, you know, seeing if maybe they, I mean, typically, especially if, I know this is going to seem a little stereotypical, but women like corals that move. It just seems like that is the predominant belief. If I'm wrong or if that's changed, you know, feel free to tell me. But typically they like the things that move. Uh, they, they like the tentacle swing on the anemones. They like gorgonians. They like LPS corals. And us guys tend to really like the hard corals that just stand there and glow in 8,000 different colors. So if you're looking at different corals together, definitely discuss what can tolerate each other or where in the tank it could go or if it's not even an option and you definitely need another tank which opens up a whole new avenue for adding another tank to your household. Um, Yashiv says, what is your opinion on regarding amino acid dosing? That is being talked about more and more recently. I don't know where that got going. I mean, amino acids have been around for a long time, but everyone's talking about dosing it like, it, like it's food. And amino acids, as far as I know, are used to stimulate the coral to eat food. It, it doesn't provide food. It's not a food itself, as far as I know. Like I said, I mean, I'm not an expert on this one specific topic. But it should trigger a feeding response in the tank, which is one of the reasons it was recommended you put in amino acids years ago, about 15 minutes before you put food in the tank. So rather than mixing them together, I would put it in separately and then go ahead and put in your food. But I, I do know that typically 50% of people that use amino acids will say, it's amazing, it changed my whole reef. And the other 50% will say, I can't tell any difference at all. So it's kind of one of those things that's not really clear to me if there's an upside or a benefit. Now, that being said, I have dosed it some in my reef, but I didn't see any change. Wakar well, is announcing best test kit. All right, Wakar, well, thanks for telling us. Actually, I know you're asking, what's the best test kit? <laughs> and there's a lot of brands out there, and there's a lot of different devices people like. Some people like automatic taste, automatic testing. Others like digital readouts, like the Hannah Checker. Uh, myself, I like the Elos test kits. I carry those on my website, as well as the Salaford test kits are now in stock. So if you like either of those, they're very accurate, and you can trust them. So those are the ones that we would recommend. Uh, Smoke and Reefer says, what's the best way to make Catomorpha tumble? I currently point a small power head upwards, but it just pushes the Cato to the back of the refugium. Yeah, um, you may be able to make like a little spray bar for your power head possibly to where you are creating a stream of water that is creating a tumbling effect and set the, like, a, let's say a maxi jet, for example, that goes into a small, whatever that is, three eighths pipe with a cap on the end and some holes and you could lay it across the bottom and have the catomorpha just do a, a rotation. That's one method. There was another thing someone did. I feel like they had their baffle come up and then they put some kind of like a plastic fin so the water would pour over and it kind of went over the fin, which created a cavitation effect and the catomorpha would tumble under it. So there's a few different uh, devices that may work in your favor. <clears throat> Uh, Leonard says, can you show how your external overflow is plumbed? It's actually on my website. If you just go to milosreef.com and then go to my tanks and find the 400 gallon, it shows all the pictures of all the plumbing and you can see everything. And if you don't want to do that and you want to go to this YouTube channel, you can go to, I think a video came out around January 1st or January 2nd. It's the six year anniversary of my reef and I cover everything, including the brand new plumbing I did last year. Uh, Dean says, have you ever used a nitrate reactor? What are your thoughts? 
P.S. You look a lot older with a beard. Well, thank you for that P.S. That just made my day. Um, <laughs> the I've never used a nitrate reactor. I, I have tons of nitrate. I don't need to react and make more. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you mean a denitrator. Um, what, are, what are my thoughts? Anything that will lower nitrate in your tank is a good thing. So whether you use bio pellets or a denitrif denitrification uh, system of some kind, or if you do massive water changes, any of those things work. And my tank was riding somewhere around 80 for a super long time, 80 ppm. It was a lot, and it was more than my ELOS test kit could measure. I actually had to buy an API test kit just to measure it to know the number. And uh, then I did a couple of monster water changes about a month and a half ago, two months ago, and that brought the numbers down to 30, and they're staying at 30. So my plan is to do this big water change on the, the reef behind me and really clean the sand bed. And when I do that, I think it'll bring it down to around 15. And once those numbers are there, I think they'll just stay there again for a super long time. But uh, I had someone lend me a denitrifier, a reactor, but my test kit said my nitrates are zero. I was like, well, what are, why would I use this thing? And so I didn't. But I guess the big question is, what are your nitrates now? What size tank do you have? And is it something you can solve, or do you actually need this device? Uh, there's a guy in Florida, Matt Dudley is his name, and he's got this huge tank. I think it was 500, 550 gallons, maybe bigger. Maybe it's 800. I don't know. It was a big tank. And he has this big, disgusting thing behind the tank near the sump that just, it looks so gross. And he uses methanol in there, if I uh, recall correctly. <clears throat> and the uh, he has, I don't know. 100, 200 antheus in that tank, and when he puts in food, he puts in so much food. But because of that gizmo that he has behind his tank, his nitrates are nice and low, and his SPS corals are gorgeous, and people buy his corals because they can't get anything that looks close to the colors he has. So he has definitely come up with the perfect balance of all things to have a ton of fish, feed like crazy, and still have vivid, colorful corals. So if you want to look for him on Facebook, Matt Dudley is his name, and I'm sure he'd tell you everything you want to know. I did film his tank last year, and I haven't had a chance to put that video up yet. Uh, Chris says, my female Clarky clown has developed Popeye in my 150-gallon tank. I'm pretty sure it's from mechanical damage rather than poor water con conditions. What are your recommendations? Uh, I would tell you to go to humble.fish in your browser and see what advice he gives you probably need to pull the fish out and put it in a hospital tank to deal with this but I don't have fish disease knowledge so I can't help you humble.fish that's it just type those two words in your browser and hit enter <clears throat> congratulations Rob that's fantastic he uh, uses well water and his uh, DI resin is being destroyed and so I told him perhaps CO2 was the problem, that his well water is filled with CO2. So he is now aerating his RO water and then pushing it through a DI, and now the DI cartridge is lasting longer, so that's great. Brian's Reef says, do you have any idea when Ecotech's Versa dosing pumps will be available again? I don't, but I've had my order with them on back order, so I can sell them myself for six months, if not longer. I would love to get those in. I'd like to get a couple more on my system, to be honest. Uh, Pickle Boy says, I have 21 snails for my cleanup crew. What is a good cleanup crew uh, to get? Well, I think I told you this in Club Miller's Reef. You need about 45 more critters for that 65-gallon aquarium. And you've got snails. You also are going to need some hermit crabs. Uh, you might want an emerald crab and uh, possibly a tuxedo urchin. And all those things will keep your rock clean because they'll be working on it constantly. And I know you also said in the uh, group that you don't have algae problems right now. So... By getting the cleanup crew now to work on the algae that's trying to grow from your lights, because your lights are going to help it grow, you will keep it under control before it becomes a big mess and you can't solve it easily. So don't delay on getting that cleanup crew. Uh, the Silent One says, My wife loves the hobby and has no issues getting what I want when I want as long as we can get our bills paid. And that's accurate. <laughs> that's true. Um, Philly Polyp says, I'm currently dosing sodium bicarbonate for an alkalinity supplement. My reef is very stable. My question is, would it be smart to switch to sodium carbonate for the higher pH benefit? 
Yes, I think it would. And uh, that's assuming I've got this correct in my brain because I always get this one backwards. But basically, rather than using that terminology, we'll just say baking soda versus soda ash. If you use soda ash, your tank will benefit from it. So baking soda can be baked in the oven for 45 minutes to drive off the CO2 out of that powder. And then after you've done it, after you've baked it, you let it cool and you put it in a Rubbermaid container and you just use it as needed, and that is soda ash. And that is what we like to use when we're dosing alkalinity to our tanks. Saltwater Reef says, what are your thoughts on putting a cleanup crew in the refugium? I wouldn't do it. I see no upside to doing that whatsoever unless you just want the entertainment. But uh, the refugium is just an area we have a bunch of plants growing. And from time to time, you need to scrape it with a, I like to use a credit card, and just get it nice and clean so you can enjoy the plants and kind of make sure everything looks good and healthy. But I don't put any kind of critters down in the sump or refugium area because I don't want them to migrate into other areas and get sucked into the protein skimmer pump, get sucked into the return pump. I, you just don't need them down there. If, uh, you, if you have some really large bristle worms that are bothering you in your main tank, you can drop them down there to work on the detritus under the macroalgae. That's fine to do. But uh, no, I wouldn't put anything else down there. I wouldn't add emerald crabs or urchins or anything in that area unless this is like a show refugium and you want it to look beautiful. Then if you want critters in there to help with tidying things, you could. Um, Kevin, thank you very much for the super chat. He says, what would be a good macroalgae to grow in my all-in-one? I don't have room for a refugium. Oh, a good macroalgae is so tough because most of the ones that grow... Oh, you know what? I like Red Dragon. I think that's the right name. Red Dragon, that sounds right. It's a red macroalgae. It's brilliant red. It looks like flames. And it doesn't hold on to anything. I mean, you can tether it to something, like tie it to some kind of a frag plug and, plug and park it somewhere, and it will grow and you can prune it, but it won't attach to stuff and become invasive. So that's a good one, and it's pretty because it's red. I, I think that would be a good one. <clears throat> um, Curtis says, my antheus was not eating, so I put some pods in just now. I've shut off everything but the power heads in the tank. Do I need to leave my skimmer off for the pods? Well, um, pods are not the natural diet of a of an antheus. I don't know which type of antheus you have, but like the liar tail, they do like things like mice. They like arctopods. They uh, they they like small plankton sized foods. You may be even able to use things like I'm surprised. Have you tried flake foods, pellet food? I mean, I'm sure you've tried certain things, but Pods is going to be an expensive way. You know, copepods, they're first of all, very small. That's not a normal food, <coughs> food for that fish. So I would try to get more choices into the system, try different types of flake food, maybe go to the fish store and buy six things and just start trying different things until you find the one your antheus likes. Um... Mr. Easy says, my tank is a year old. When I started, I was dosing microlift bacteria. Will I ever need to start adding good bacteria again in the future? Uh, some of us do. Uh, for example, I dose Prodibio into my tank, which is two types of bacteria that go in my tank every 15 days. And uh, Microbacter 7 is another brand a lot of people use, and they'll use it weekly in their aquarium. There is something called Dr. Tim's Waste Away, which is another type of bacteria that people add to their tanks to help keep things clean. Um, so it does, it actually is a good thing. And then sometimes people like to get a scoop of live sand from another person's aquarium or from an aquarium at the fish store to add to their own sand bed to add some diverse new bacteria into the system. So yes, it would be a good thing to do from time to time. Um, Lazy Lagoon Reefer says, I've been struggling with high nitrates and can't seem to find a source. Like it's been staying around 50 even with water changes and bio pellets, do you think dosing vinegar in conjunction would help? Uh, yeah, let me think about that for a second. Vinegar and bio pellets, I believe, won't be a problem. But some people will dose just vinegar, or just vodka, or just sugar. And others will dose VSV, which is vinegar, sugar, vodka combined in a recipe, and they dose that in their tank each day to lower nitrate. And they wouldn't use bio pellets in that scenario. Uh, you didn't say what size your tank was, but ginormous water changes will definitely do it. And I know that because I did it. So I did a... How much did I change? Do you guys remember? I feel like I changed something like... 
450 or 480 gallons in a week's time on my aquarium uh, a couple months ago. It was a big number. I went through my poly tank twice and it holds 265 gallons. So it must have been around 550, I think. It was crazy. Uh, Macy's Daddy says, amino acids, thank you. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. It's easily consumed by the coral as food. I guess I need to read up on it again. So if I said something incorrect before, but as far as I knew, it was a triggering response to get corals to eat. Uh, Ron, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate it. SJ says, what times do your streams start? They typically start at 2.08 Texas time on Saturdays. Uh, Yashiv says, thanks so much for the amazing advice. As always, these streams have made my reefing journey much smoother. I'm glad it's helping. And that's the whole point. You know, we, we discuss stuff and we give you ideas and uh, I mention stuff and other people in the chat mention things and it gets us all thinking and we avoid making mistakes that could affect livestock in a bad way. Uh, Pickle Boy asked, my tank's been running for about a month and a half. How long should I wait before I get a bubble tip anemone? I would say wait nine months. Uh, Rooster Pinto says, good evening from Portugal. There, is there any kind of a hormone or temperature rise or drop for making the clownfish have babies? I have five to 12 months and there's nothing. So clownfish mature to be sexually active and depending on the species of clownfish, or breed, I don't know if I said that right. Um, it could be years before they're sexually mature. Just because you have a pair that are together doesn't mean that they are ready to spawn and to put down a clutch of eggs. So I know some of them could, you could have them two, three years before they're ready to start laying eggs. It's not necessarily that you need to change the water temperature or you have to feed more heavily or something. But I mean, a well-fed clownfish is more likely to spawn, but if it's too young, it's sexually immature, it won't do it yet. So you need to wait until it is the right time. And basically you can watch them and see and if the clownfish are using their mouth to clean the rock, like you're preparing an area where they might want to put eggs down, that's a good sign. And that means they're getting in the mood. And uh, of course people are going to joke and say, you know, play some Barry White and uh, stuff like that. But it will be, it'll happen when it's time. But it's not really something that we can rush as humans. Um... Ron says, any tips on cycling a bare bottom tank? Well, it's very similar to cycling any tank. I mean, it's ammonia, and ammonia will convert into nitrite, which will convert into nitrate. Having no sand in the bottom of the tank would still allow you to have a cycle. Uh, the sand has nothing to do with a cycle. It doesn't create a cycle. It doesn't cause a cycle. It, it won't speed one up or slow one down. It's just an area for bacteria to live. But uh, if you don't have sand, then it's just going to be on the rock. And if you're using a brand new tank that's got no sand and dry rock, the only bacteria you're going to have is the bacteria you're adding yourself, as well as the ammonia. So you're just going to go through that. Uh, I do sell a kit uh, from Brightwell that is the dry rock starter kit that comes with the ammonia, and it comes with Mycobacter Clean, and it comes with one other thing. And that is to help you get your tank cycled. And it actually works rather quickly, supposedly as quick as eight days. And then you're able to start introducing your first fish. Will Marr says, uh, usually corals and fish foods have a lot of amino acids in them. Be careful when dosing too much. You could cause a, a spike of green in your sand bed. So that green may have even been uh, green cyanobacteria. Uh, it could just be the, the sand got green, but it could be cyanobacteria because that's another color that cyanobacteria comes in. And uh, if you... Uh, are feeding too heavily, you'll just keep feeding that bacteria and it just continues to grow and spread and it becomes a problem. Macy's Taddy says, can I help you edit your backlog of videos? Just give me time. It's been a, a very busy year business-wise and it made it, I haven't had the time to sit at the computer and edit. But uh, eventually I'll, I'll start cranking out some and, and you guys will be like, ah, finally he's doing it. I'm kind of particular how my videos come out too, but thank you. Plus, they're all on my massive hard drive. And what am I going to do? Just ship you my hard drive? No. 
Robert says, which phosphate checker do you recommend? I think Hannah has two. They do have two kinds. They have an ultra low kind and they have the standard one. And uh, me, I would use a standard one because my, my phosphates are never ultra low. So I would use the PPM, not the PPB, which is parts per billion. But uh, honestly, I find that the ELOS test or the Salifer test is so easy to do. It takes you 30 seconds, and uh, I, would, I would lean into that one. If you like a HANA checker, get the alkalinity one. That's a great one, easy to read. But uh, for phosphate, ELOS or Salifer, both are super easy. And you'll, you'll know. Either the water's clear, you have no phosphate, or it's blue and you got a lot, and then anything in between that. Just my opinion. Uh, Mark says, any news on the video from Long Island Aquarium, your last trip? Please make it as long as possible. Very long. Well, we'll I will use as much footage as I can, and it should be a relatively long one. Joe had a lot of things to say, which I think will be interesting. <clears throat> And Rory Kane is chiming in on the significant other part. He said, my wife told me I can have any size tank as long as we, uh, as long as we bought a house first and the bills are paid. <laughs> She's very reasonable as long as the necessities are met. And that's how it should be. Uh, Mike says, I've been dosing alkalinity during the night to help with my pH. So your recommendation is to dose during the day. My recommendation is to start it at 5 a.m. Uh, because that is when your pH is at its lowest. And uh, if you're using a pH meter, you can actually see the numbers with your own eyes and see what's happening. And even as you dose the alkalinity, whether, and if you dose a decent amount, you'll just push the pH up. And then the pH will be one to drop off, but by the time it's gotten a little bit lower, the lights are turning on, which helps bring it up again, because now you're having photosynthesis in the tank and oxygen is being developed and CO2 is being burned off. So yeah, I would recommend early morning to dose it. And maybe, I, I don't know what your pH numbers are, but rather than lots of little doses, maybe you just give it one or two big doses. You know, the, instead of 10 tiny doses, two reasonable doses. And just push it up where it belongs. Uh, T-Bass says, what do you feed your copper band? Any advice? Mine picks on its food, like my sis, 10 to 12 pieces and ignores the rest. So uh, what I did when I got my copper band is I asked the fish store to feed it in front of me. And it was eating brine shrimp. And so I said, give me all your brine shrimp. <laughs> and I came home. And I was dumping brine shrimp in like crazy to make sure that copper band was eating, 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 eating. And then every time I poured in food for the reef, the same food I always use, I added brine shrimp also into the tank so the copper band could go after that food and the fish could go after theirs, but hopefully the copper band would start liking other foods. I also was adding, now one thing copper bands do like is black worms. And if you live in an area where you can get black worms, live black worms, that would be great. But uh, I don't live in that type of area, so I have to get frozen blood worms. And I was using blood worms for a very long time to give the copper band a nice alternative. And for a while there, the copper band was eating it. And then one day I noticed the copper band didn't care about the blood worms anymore and was going after the mysis. And I stopped worrying about her because it was eating another food I use every single day. And the only time I'm worried about that fish is when I, I let the clock get away from me and it's late at night and I should have fed by 1030. And I, and I look at the clock, it's 1115. And I just want to throw in some flake food quickly. And the copper band's like, where's my food? And I start feeling really badly. So I try to always thaw out frozen food every single night and put in food that the copper band will eat as well as all the other fish. So that's my technique. Uh, Dan says, I miss what you were saying about well water and the DI I'm burning through it. Okay, so <clears throat> well water can have CO2. It doesn't happen to everyone, but some people have discovered when they make their RODI water, their DI resin is burning up much too quickly. You know, a, a DI cartridge, which is cation and anion resin, it's usually combined in one. Some people have them separated. And as the RO water goes through it, the DI polishes off the last of the TDS, which is the total dissolved solids. And if the number's nice and low coming out of your membrane, which could be as low as three or four, then the DI should have no problem removing the last of it. And you should get like six, 800 gallons of water through a DI cartridge before you have to replace it. But that person was saying, I think his name was Rob, said that his DI was going bad in about 90 gallons, which is very expensive. So I said, you might have a problem with CO2. So the cure is you collect RO water in a barrel. So the RO system is pumping out water into a big barrel, and then you put in a large PVC pipe down into the barrel, and you snake an air stone to the bottom of an air line, an air pump, 
to oxygenate the water in the PVC pipe that is sitting at an angle in this barrel of RO water. And then you will draw water from the PVC pipe through some kind of a pump, could be a dosing pump, I guess, and trickle it through the DI resin. And now the oxygenated water will have the CO2 driven off. That oxygenated water will go through the dosing pump, through the DI, and come out the other side, and the DI doesn't wear out as quickly. So that is the solution. Uh, the person that showed me this, I was visiting him, it was in his basement, and I was fascinated by what he was doing. He used something called a permeate pump. So I don't know that it matters what pump you use exactly. I mean, it'd be nice to know how many, uh, I was going to say gallons, <laughs> but it's really not. It's uh, how much water has to move through the DI resin, which I think is like a third of a gallon a minute usually, maybe a little bit slower. And so you're using a pump that moves the water quietly through the DI resin at the right rate. You're not trying to rush it through, but you are getting rid of that CO2 in the first place. So hopefully that helps you as well. Uh, Kurt says, should there be more water going through the skimmer or the refugium zone in a sump? 75% of the water from your tank should drain into the skimmer section and 25% of the refugium. I like to break it up that way, and I've been recommending that forever because 75% would be processed by the protein skimmer or bypassing it. And then the other 25% is raw water from the aquarium that feeds the refugium, which means you don't have to actually physically put food down in there for the macroalgae. It's just the fish waste and little bits of food that got down the drain will end up getting into the refugium zone, and, plant, and the plants and the little bugs and things that are living down there will thrive off of it. You don't have to do anything special. Uh, the spiritual counselor says, thanks for the info on your page about getting rid of red cyanobacteria. He said, I have a 440 and got a bad flare-up after dosing no pox. Yep. And followed your steps, and now it's all gone. I turned the skimmer back on today. Congratulations. That's great. Now, when you turn on your skimmer, it's probably going to overflow like crazy. So if you can, take the collection cups, tube that comes out, and run it into a barrel or a trash can or a bucket or something, because it's going to just overflow like crazy. And then instead of topping off with fresh water, top off with salt water and let it just replace whatever the skimmer is dumping out until the skimmer finally settles down. And it might pull out 14 gallons, it might pull out 29 gallons, and it might look like nothing, just water. That's okay. Just let it pull out whatever it wants. You know, I, one thing I do want to say, and I, there, I have a very short video about this on my channel here, uh, something about make it stop, and uh, the protein skimmer is going bonkers. So adjust the protein skimmer to the lowest point it possibly can, but it's still going to overflow like crazy and just let it drain, 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 drain. And then when it's finally done, it could take a few hours. You know, you've replaced all the water you lost with new salt water. It was like another water change, even though you didn't have to do a thing. And then your skimmer settles down, you can set the auto top off back to RODI water, and your protein skimmer's working again, and you can put it back into its normal waste collector. Smoking Reefer says, why do bubble tip and enemies split? Uh, it could be a, a panic response, like they are um, scared and they're trying to keep themselves alive, like, Oh my god, things are so bad, I better make another one of me in case I die. That's one version of what could be happening. The other version, it just got to a certain size and it wants to be two. It wants to, One wants to go this way and one wants to go that way. And that's what they do. They literally tear themselves in half. Uh, it could be because you fed it heavily and then did a big water change and that triggered a split. Again, it's a, it's a reaction, a stress reaction that the anemone thinks it needs to split. Now, that being said, they don't have to split, and there's not a need for them to split. They, you know, People that are making them split are doing it because they want to make money. And I had a buddy who just had tons of anemones all the time, and he was selling them left and right. And he says, oh, my God, I, I keep having more and more splits. It just won't stop. And I told him, if you would just have some stable water parameters, this would stop. And he finally listened to me, and he straightened out his water parameters. And what do you know? They stopped splitting. <laughs> so... Yeah, it's not normal for them to split. They don't need to. I mean, there's a point where they get so darn big they have to. I had one in my uh, 215 that was easily 24 inches in diameter. It was gorgeous. And I was like, wow, this thing just does not want to split. The next day it split. So that was funny. Pickle Boy asked, do I need to start a refugium? Nope, you don't. Your tank is too young. You talked about getting more cleanup crew. If you want, you can get those things. That's fine. But you need to have 65 critters in that tank. Mm. 
Rogue Aquarium says the Start XLM from Brightwell is a great product to get uh, your tank started. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, Maria says, how long after you've got things going, mine's about four months old, before I should get a protein skimmer? I don't have room for refugiums and the skimmer, so I'm trying to decide. Uh, I would say now. Your tank's been running for about four months. It's a great time to have a protein skimmer on there. And if you don't have room for both, then you just do one. You have a skimmer and you have a return pump. You want a small sump, I think. You know, I don't know if you're doing a sump or you're hanging on the back of the aquarium. But if you have a sump, you need some kind of baffles to divide the skimmer section from the return zone. And that's really important. Um, back behind me here is a sump that you can kind of see. And this is the skimmer section. And then this is the return zone. So like you don't have a refugium. So just pretend it's this big. And you have your skimmer right here, the water drains in. This water level stays the same height all the time, and then it flows through the baffles, and then this water level rises and falls as evaporation occurs, and you top off. But if you just run a protein skimmer, it'll keep your tank nice and clean. So I would definitely recommend that. I think it's time. And thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that too. Uh, Macy's Daddy says, do you have a strategy to make your fish tank not smell fishy? Number one, clean it. Clean everything. Clean the tank. Clean the top rim of the tank. Clean inside the canopy. Clean down around the sump. Wipe the sump down inside and out. Just clean, 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 clean. And then run fresh carbon in a reactor. And if you do that once a month, you shouldn't have a fishy smell. Lastly, the smell could become from the protein skimmer. Cleaning the, pro the protein skimmer's collection cup every day or every couple of days would go a long way to getting rid of any kind of smells that are bothering you guys. <clears throat> um, Jason says, I can't get any reading on my nitrate or phosphate. I have 120 gallon with only fish. Should I add more? Um, start feeding the fish more? <laughs> feed them with a spoon? Uh, you can, you can feed more, but it doesn't really, mm, I'm going to say it doesn't matter. It's fish only. Is there a reason you need nitrate and phosphate in your water for a fish only tank? I think that will just happen over time. It'll just eventually get to the point where you have this many months where it was un undetectable, and now the number has finally risen, and it is now uh, getting to the point where you have to deal with it. But I wouldn't dose it in yours. Now, if you're trying to keep corals, I would say you need to dose a little bit of nitrate and phosphate and actually sell that in a bottle where you pour it in. Uh, I don't need to do that because my tank always has it. Um, it's been notoriously good at growing or I say growing, making nitrate and phosphate. And I'm always trying to remove it from the system. Uh, John says, what do you keep your tank temperature at? I like 77 to 79. So that area right there. Uh, I've been reading temps in the lower 80s can kill off dinos lately. There's always a theory about dinos. There's hundreds of theories about dino flagellates. Uh, I do believe... Raising the temperature can help with some things, but I don't know it's going to affect dinoflagellates. So I wouldn't get your hopes up. Uh, Rob says he's using a dosing pump through the DI that's 50 milliliters per hour. So there's a number for you guys to work with if you're trying to do the off-gassing of CO2 to make DI water. Thank you very much, Rob. Yeah, 50 milliliters per minute. Yeah, yeah. Correction, correction, 50 milliliters per minute. That's kind of like uh, my calcium reactor runs at, um, I think, 60 milliliters a minute, and you're pushing water. That sounds right. It's a slow trickle going through the DI resin. I like it. <laughs> James says, my copper band has a watch. He knows when it's feeding time. All my fish know when it's feeding time. I literally need to put like a reminder in my watch to like hit me, you know, a vibration on my watch at 10.15 to thaw fish food because it seems like every single night for the last month, I'm like, oh my God, it's already 10.30. How is it 10.30? And I'm rushing to melt fish food before the lights start cycling off. Okay, Alexi says, what if you let your refugium get all the tank water and then pour that into the protein skimmer afterwards? Like what you do, what you do. <laughs> like why do you do what you do for the sun? Okay, the, uh, 
Triton method recommends you do that. You drain the refugium from the tank, the refugium grows a ton of algae, and then the water pours into the protein skimmer zone, and then the water continues to the return zone and goes back up to the tank. That's their recommendation. That's actually not the advice we've been giving forever because your protein skimmer would be able to just export all your copepods and things that you want coming from the refugium to get into the display tank. So I don't recommend that. That's why I say have 75% of your water go to the protein skimmer and let it do its job. Remove all the dissolved organic compounds, remove what it can from the system, and keep the water nice and crystal clear. And then the refugium zone gets 25% of the water from the display tank, and that water flows out of the refugium right back into the return zone where the return pump can catch it and push up, hopefully, little bugs and pods and uh, snacks that your fish can eat, which is natural, free food. So if you were to buy copepods and you want to pour them in your tank, you could either pour them inside the tank itself after lights out, like into the rock work where it won't get destroyed by pumps, or you could pour it directly into the refugium where they're completely safe from any kind of predators, and then as they breed and propagate themselves, their little babies flush through the water and into the pumps and into the tank, and your fish can devour them. So there is, that is the thinking behind it, why we don't try to skim everything that comes out of the refugium. Mm, this I don't know, Will. He says, what do you think about instant ocean reef accelerator addicted? I don't know what that is. Uh, sorry, I can't answer you on that one. Uh, Thomas says, I have a hang on back Aquamax refugium. Do I need to add a power head to keep the Catomorpha tumbling, or can the Cato just do its job hanging out in the refugium? It could be okay, and you might from time to time just take it out and turn it and put it back in, you know, kind of flip it a little bit. You could pivot it, you know, round around a, a, a little bit, but it's not an absolutely mandatory thing. Catomorpha is sort of easy to grow, and the general rule of thinking is if you can keep it tumbling. But think about those Catomorpha reactors, where it's just a cylinder with some acrylic wheels that are perforated and then there's a light going down the center or there's lights wrapped around the outside that's how it's not moving at all and it still grows so i don't really think it has to move as much but if you have access to reach into a refugium you definitely could take it and turn it manually once every couple of days or once a week because where it grows best is where the light's hitting but then the underside's shaded so by turning it you're kind of getting light on all parts of the plant so that you get the most growth and the most benefit out of it Um, Tim says, where are the booster pumps installed on your RODI? I bought one and put it before the pre-filters, though I'm not getting an increased reading on the gauge. Do you need to put it right before the membrane? <laughs> yes, you do need to put it right before the membrane, period. Uh, it's designed, okay, so let me tell you about booster pumps. The booster pump is a mechanical pump that applies more PSI to the water going to the membrane. And if you put the booster pump before the pre-filters, and especially if the RODI system has acrylic housings, those housings can rupture. They could potentially explode. So it's best to have the booster pump push, have the water go into the pre-filters, the sediment and carbon, carbon, or sediment, carbon, chlor chloramine buster. And then it goes into the booster pump. And from the booster pump, it goes to the membrane, because the membrane is in a PVC housing. And PVC has a much higher PSI rating so it can handle that pressure, where the water going through the uh, acrylic housings might only be 40 or 50 or 60 PSI, but the booster pump pushes you up to like 80, 90, 100, 110 PSI. So you put that pressure on the membrane in the PVC housing that can handle that pressure, and then some of it goes down the drain, and the rest of the water goes into the DI, which is an acrylic housing, but it's only like a quarter or a half as much water, so there's no PSI being put on that. So that's why we route it that way. So it gets installed before the membrane specifically. And that's it. Battle OCR told me that he's late, so we should start over. Uh, Reefer Madness says, can I use a breeder box and use that as a refugium? Yeah, some people have done it. Uh, the holes are going to be really small on it, so I don't know what benefit you'll get besides growing some algae in a box. Because, like I said, the pods can't really get out, necessarily. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. You can try it. See what you think. Um, uh, 
the next question was, is Spock okay now? Nah, she's not really okay. She, her eye looks worse and worse. At some point, I don't know, something might have to happen. I feel bad for her. She definitely is looking at food from one side and not from the other. So I can put food in the tank and she'll swim away. And then when she turns, she's like, ah, the food is here. And she gets super excited. Um, why don't we give her some banana on camera? Oh, it's so dark. Why is it so dark? That's crazy. Um, I think there's a setting I have to adjust here. Give me a second. That doesn't help. Okay, we'll go to here. Oh, wait, what's this? That doesn't help at all. <laughs> Working on it. Give me a second. How about this? There we go. Why don't we throw some gain in the tank? All right. I think that looks okay. It's a little crooked. I'm making you seasick yet. Someone gave us some super chat money to buy a banana for Spock. So here is said banana. <laughs> and all I do is take off the tip of the banana, just a small little bit. We're not putting a lot in the tank. So we have a small piece here, a little nugget. And I need my step ladder to reach. Spock saw it. See if she notices my fingers up here. That's me. That's me. Oh, there it goes. Go get it. I'll get another piece. But the fish do like banana, as do I. I found that the purple tang likes it, Spock likes it, the Antheus like it, and I've even seen the skunks go after it. Try to hold on to it a little bit better this time. So you can just take it and break it up in your hand, just smash it in the water, and then your fish can all just chase it like they do all the other foods they normally eat. And banana has potassium. Now I don't, I'm not going to say that's going to suddenly raise your potassium levels, but it's nice. There you go. That was a quick little snack. Any more questions? Because we're going to wrap up this show otherwise, so I can get some more work done today. Let's see. Um, so I see a bunch of stuff came through. Hang on. Billy says, will I be able to place electronics above my sump, assuming I have multiple PC fans pulling, pushing air in out of the stand? Actually, you want to push all the air into the stand. Don't pull anything out. Just push air in. Just have the fans blow air into your stand, and it will force air out of the stand wherever you can find a way out. So you don't have to worry about the pushing, pulling thing. Because if you take a fan and you suck air out of the sump area, it's moist, it's salty, it destroys the fan doesn't help. 
But if you push in fresh air, you're actually keeping the tank cooler because the air in the room is nice and cool, and you're forcing out the warm air out of the stand. So do that first of all. Now, can your electronics be above the sump? Yes. <clears throat> Secure everything, screwing things in, using uh, any kind of holders and zip ties to keep everything nice and tidy. And think about where everything is and how could it possibly get wet. Is there anything that's going to squirt on it, splash on it, spatter on it, uh, drip on it? All of that has to be considered as you plan where everything goes. So be very uh, uh, I can't think of the perfect word that I'm trying to say right now, but you want to really think it through. You want to anticipate all the bad things that could possibly happen and find those sweet spots where everything can be nice and safe. I have a I'll show you a thing here under the tank. I have to lower this though. Or actually I'll just hold it. So down here, oh, my hand is really shaking. So down here <clears throat> is a wooden board, and that wooden board has an EVA32 on the back side, and that's where it has a bunch of plugs. And I just hung that on this rail. See, I can actually move it. And this keeps my electronics under the tank. There's no way water can get on it. It is a completely dry spot. I have buttons over here that are low voltage that are only for the breakout box, and they let me turn things on and off. But I don't have anything near where there's actually water or something that's spray or hit it. Even this right here is a drain line that is under my electronics. So it's going to drain here onto the floor into a drip pan. So that is something to keep in mind as you're designing your setup. The cube is just so pretty today. Oh, the color looks totally off because the spectrum changed. But uh, it's looking really, really well. It's going to get more and more fluffy. It looks a little empty without Dory in there. Let's see. Uh, Reefer Madness said... Um, I've seen her live for a while, and I, I knew that she had a bad eye, and you were flying out the fish doctor. The fish doctor was actually local. I didn't have to fly her. She was here in Dallas. Uh, can you catch us up? All that happened was the doctor removed her, weighed her, inspected her, studied the eye under a special light, did all kinds of stuff, but didn't actually uh, come up with anything that had to be done. There, there was no sign of infection. There was no sign of pain on the fish's part. She wasn't scratching. She wasn't doing anything weird. And so the vet just said she'd like to come back in six months which it's basically been six, six months, maybe even longer, since all that happened. But, you know, with COVID, everything got put on hold. Let's see. Uh, Robert Lawrence says, how far down have you positioned your MP40? On the cube, it's up near the surface. It's about four or five inches, no, about four inches down. And on the reef... It's down this high on the tank, flowing water straight across this direction. So you can see the MP40 down here. You can see the cleaning magnet up here, and the water line is way up here. So it's down probably about six, eight inches down. Uh, Glenn says, what will be your next major change with the aquarium? Uh, any changes with your corals? Um, I don't really have any major plans. I'm kind of hoping I can leave it alone and let it grow, but you know, things have to be trimmed from time to time. The big change, I think, is just attacking the sand bed and really trying to clean it, which has been uh, left alone for so long. Uh, and then Tim says, what is the maximum percentage you run your power heads on? I believe they're running, the maximum is 85%, uh, and there's four different modes that the vortex go through each day. So I'd have to double check some, some of that for information for you, but uh, I think 85% is my maximum. Some of it's actually less than that. <clears throat> uh, Maria says, do you have uh, any acrylic dividers of some sort to section off the protein skimmer and the sump? Yes, I actually sell a kit. So if you have a glass aquarium, you just tell me, you measure the inside width with a tape measure, give me the real number, 
and then I can cut the baffles to fit that tank exactly. And I sell baffles to people all the time, and I can send you uh, three baffles right after your skimmer zone before the return, and you can just silicone those right into your aquarium. It's that easy. Um, Chef Kumayoki says, I have a 125 gallon tank, only 22 inches down below. Yeah, that's a problem. What would be a good skimmer, or should I use a hang on back protein skimmer? I would really like to see you have a skimmer underneath, but 22 inches is a very shallow area. You'll have to look at all the brands of skimmers out there and see what will fit. The second model of the NIOS, which I think is the NIOS 160, that is rated for your size tank and may be short enough to fit inside your sump. So you could look into that. Um, I actually have that one in stock, by the way. <laughs> so if you were looking at it, the NIOS 160 is the model. And double check the measurement and see what you think. Rob says, when did you move Dory? It happened yesterday. What is the alien thing floating around in the new cube? The alien thing might be a sponge. There's a uh, big clump of spun white sponge that was moving around earlier. Yeah, it's in the back corner now. So I'm going to obviously have to catch that and remove it. Boy, the colors are hideous right now on this. I can't stand it. Let me see if I can fix any of this. I was messing with it earlier. Let's do this. That's a little bit better. That looks a little bit better. Yeah. Anyway. Nothing looks good on a webcam. <laughs> it never has. It never will. Uh, Maria, we just moved the hippo out of there. All the clownfish are hiding in there right now. If I did a little bit of food, they may come out. Back this up. So we can lure these clownfish out into the open. See some faces. See some of the clowns? They are definitely staying close to their tentacles today. They usually get fed at night though, so they're this is a weird time for them to be fed. We change the angle. There's some clowns. I mean, they just went through quite the upheaval yesterday, so I'm not really surprised that they're being super skittish today. All right. Already? Uh, emerald crabs, yes or no? My clownfish sleep on the sand bed, and I hate to come down and see one of them being munched on. They really can be fine. I mean, you're always going to hear about somebody has a story, but most of the time the uh, emerald crabs are eating bubble algae. Uh, they might try and eat other foods, but uh, I've seen them actually eat calerpa off the rockwork, which was great and get rid of it, but I've never seen one catch a fish or try to kill a fish. Now, is it possible that one could opportunistically stumble on a fish and say, here's a meal? It's potentially possible, but it's not their standard. It's not their normal diet. They're not fish hunters like uh, the Sally Lightfoot might be. And Norb says, I'd be interested in getting several baffles for my fuge and sump. Do I forward the dimensions to you? Do you require a sketch? Sketch is fine, uh, but what you can do is just get me those dimensions specifically. I do have a set of baffles on my website that you can check out, and you can see if that's going to work for you. And then you can place them anywhere you want inside your aquarium to create the sump and refugium zone and see if that might be ideal. I, my stuff's pretty simple because I like simple. Simple is easy for you and lets you just put it in and be done. <laughs> so uh, that's why I recommend what I do. But uh, you can definitely send me a, an email, and my email is sales at milosreef.com. 
Well, guys, today is water test Saturday. It's really important you test your water. According to Caitlin, testing water saves lives. And I, I like that. I thought that was a pretty good line. So let's test our water today, make sure everything is good. We want to know for a fact, not just, oh, yeah, it looks fine. That's not testing. Testing is to get your test kits and actually do it. And as I told you guys at the beginning of the stream, I have a new device that is going to be added to the shop later today, and it will test your water for you by spinning a magnetic bead inside the vial so you don't have to shake the vial by hand anymore as you add the drops. And uh, those um, smart stir testers are $30, and I hope that you find them as useful as the one I've been using for years. I love the one I've got. And mine was a 3D one some guy printed out of China and sent it to me as a gift. And I've been using it ever since. And to actually shake a tube drives me crazy. So I, I was so happy when these finally came to market. And so I got a few to put in the shop to see how you guys respond. And uh, please test your water. Make sure your alkaline, your calcium, your nitrate, your phosphate, magnesium, temperature, pH, salinity. You want to know all those numbers. And you should definitely log them in Reef Trace. It's a great app that helps you graph all of your parameters. It also has the local fish store uh, map in there where you can find any fish stores within a 45 mile radius of you. It's linked to the critter ID section on my website when you're looking at different things, whether it's corals or fish or invertebrates. Um, there's a marketplace in there. There's a lot of stuff in that app. It's very nice. It, that app has really grown into something beautiful and robust over the last two years. So if you don't have that app, that's something else you can get today. <laughs> and uh, other than that, I hope you guys have a great week and I will see you again. Oh, I want to tell you one more thing. <clears throat> my uh, goal, is to come up with these live stream topics in advance and stick them on the calendar on the new website. So when that happens, you'll actually get to see the topics coming up for the next few, you know, I don't know. Let's just say the next few months, hopefully I can do that. And that way it won't be a surprise topic. You'll just know it's coming up in two weeks or whatever. And uh, I think that'd be kind of cool and that'll allow uh, Reef Trace to push to your phone, hey, the stream is starting and here's the topic. So that'd be kind of cool. Other than that, I'm gonna, and here, I think that we had a really good topic. I look forward to seeing anything you have to say about this topic in Club Miller's Reef. I do encourage you to do that. And if you buy anything from millersreef.com, it helps pay the bills. So I appreciate your support, and I will talk to you guys in a week. Bye.